Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you here to the Royal Irish Academy for our discourse today. Uh, just a small point. Up to a few weeks ago, this room was scaffolded and we had no use of it, either during the pandemic for obvious reasons, but then more recently because it was being restored. So it is absolutely lovely to welcome you here to our meeting room and indeed to the first discourse that I have been able to preside over back in this meeting room since I was elected president in, on March the 16th, 2020. So this is a really pleasurable occasion. And it is even more pleasurable for me to greet our guests today. Uh, so first of all, I'm Mary Canning, I'm president of the Academy. Uh, present here this afternoon are Mary O'Dowd, who is our secretary, and Patrick Honahan, who is our treasurer, and our new executive director, Siobhan O'Sullivan, and Professor Jerry McKenna, who is our senior vice president. Academy discourses are the oldest and most renowned series of talks in Ireland. Their first discourses were presented in 1786, and historically, they were the occasion reserved for the most distinguished academics to first reveal and discuss their work in public. We now record these discourses, and they are available on the Academy's website. And be, just before we begin, with your permission, I have a small amount of business to undertake. The minutes of our last discourse, 100 years on, Ireland, Finland, New Zealand and Poland, a comparative history, took place on December the 8th, 2022, and those minutes are posted online. Since no members inform us of any issues with these minutes, I will take them as approved and I will sign the minute book after this discourse. So this afternoon, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Ignatieff and Professor Ben Tonra. Michael Ignatieff is a public intellectual, a university professor, a writer, a former politician. Between 2006 and 2011, he served as MP in the Parliament of Canada and then as leader of the Liberal Party of Canada and leader of the official opposition. Between 2012 and 2015, Professor Ignatieff served as Centennial Chair at the Carnegie Council for Ethics in International Affairs in New York. Between 2014 and 16, he was the Edward Murrow Chair of Press, Politics and Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School. Until recently, he was the rector and president of the Central European University, and he stepped down at the end of July 2021 to remain as professor in the history department. As you all know, without any doubt, the Central European University, which was set up in Budapest, was obliged to move to Vienna um, for various reasons and um, perhaps relevant to the subject today, which is going to dwell, I think, on academic freedom. Professor Ben Tonra is Professor of International Relations at University College Dublin School of Politics and International Relations. At UCD, he teaches, researches, and publishes in European foreign security and defense policy, Irish foreign security and defense policy, and international relations theory. He worked previously at the Department of International Politics at the University of Wales in Aberystwyth, Trinity College Dublin, and the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, DC. Professor Tonra was elected a member of the Royal Irish Academy in 2020, and previously served as the chair of the Academy's Standing Committee on International Affairs. Following the discourse, we will have an opportunity for lots of questions. And based on Professor Ignatius's 
a wonderful lecture last night at the, the Edmund Burke Lecture in Trinity College. Uh, I anticipate we will have a lively discussion. Last night, Professor Ignatieff invited the audience to be hard on him, and here inside a more intimate environment in the academy, we, we might be hard too. So uh, it is over to you, Professor Ignatieff, and thank you very much. Thank you, President. I hope, I hope we're not hard, but we're certainly going to be rigorous. Um, and, and I really do look forward to the, to the converse, subsequent conversation and, and discussion. Um, but by way of introduction, I mean, Michael, you're, you're an ideal person to talk about academic freedom in as much as you have traversed different worlds over your career, academia into journalism, academia, and, and into politics. Um, so you bring a particular perspective in looking at the role of universities in, in modern democracies. Can you perhaps identify some of the themes that have, that have motivated you or, or some common themes and threads through that career progression that particularly inform our, our conversation today? Hmm. It's a great, tough way to start. Um, I've been in and out of academic life all my life. Um, and. Uh, impatient with academic life, so impatient that I kind of climb over the monastery wall and have some time doing something else. Um, but I keep climbing back over the monastery wall back inside. I think it helps me to see why universities matter, um, especially in the 21st century. All the cliches about us being a knowledge society are, are true. Um, and universities are the institution that curates old knowledge, look at this, and creates new knowledge, and then teaches students, hopefully at the frontier of new knowledge, <clears throat> and teaches students how to think about knowledge, and this is drivingly relevant to our democratic difficulties now, as everybody knows, because in some ways um, our democracies are facing what could be called a, an epistemological crisis to get fancy about it. That is, public policy depends on, or ought to depend on, Irish people concluding more or less that certain things are true about the health service or about transport or about relations with the United Kingdom or uh, the situation in Belfast. Certain things are either true or they're not. And, you, and if you then have a, a democracy where people saying there really aren't any true facts out there, there's just, it's all perspectival, or if they, Every time you enunciate that a certain thing is a fact, someone says that's fake news, democracy itself is in some difficulty because you just, we don't acknowledge how much a common ground of accepted fact is the basis of all democratic discussion. And universities have a key role in kind of validating what counts as a, as a fact. We're not perfect at it, and inside the academy, as we all know, there's ferocious debates about what is true and what's false and who's got it right and who's got it wrong, but that's, that conversation inside the academy is vital, I would argue, to freedom outside. We will not have freedom long if we lose the capacity to generate a commonly accepted set of facts that we hold to be the basis of our democratic discussions. And universities are at the center of that. And, and what is then interesting is the ways in which a certain kind of, popul a certain kind of popul politician, often called populist, has twigged to the immense power that universities hold in modern society to validate and curate knowledge. And they've gone after us in a very direct and open way, in a way that is new in my lifetime. Um, 
Michael Gove saying in the Brexit debate, we've had enough of experts, is, is kind of canonical part of that. An amazing statement from a guy who's university educated and actually in his daily practice kind of respects evidence, but he saw uh, how much red meat it was to suddenly go after the experts, go after the academics, and this is an absolutely standard trope in the populism of left and right across Europe. Um, one of the reasons we were driven out of Hungary was that Orban was, had absolute perfect pitch for a certain kind of anti-intellectualism in the Hungarian public, which said, what do we need this damn university for? They're all well-paid, spoiled, you know, you know um, whiners. Um, so for the first time in my lifetime, the, uh, the university is in the front line of an attack on our constitutive role in democracy itself. And I think that, to come back to your question, is what I've learned from jumping over the monastery wall and back so many times. But considering the, the centrality of the universities, you say, and sort of the, the constitutional and sociopolitical architecture of the, of the democratic state, isn't it extraordinary that we've come to a pass in which a foundational concept like academic freedom is now perceived, I think, largely in the public space as being elitist, effete, um, exclusive, and something that is, that is almost marginal to our conversation? Hmm. Well, I, I think there's some good reasons why academic freedom is seen exactly as you say. Um, I, by the way, in a, in a long and extremely happy career, have never had tenure. I don't know what happened. I don't get, I don't get sabbaticals. I've never had a leave. I keep sort of not getting the point of this thing. I, I clearly manage my academic career very badly. But anyway, if you know, 30, 40 years ago, you asked what academic freedom was in the United States, I don't know about Ireland, people would have said it's the privilege of tenured academics. It means you can't be fired for holding certain political views. Once you're in the tent and you have tenure, that's what academic freedom, it's a privilege of tenure. And the minute you call academic freedom a privilege, you're wide open to it's the elitist um, privilege of a unaccountable elite. And I think universities have opened themselves up to that criticism by not explaining to the public as strongly as we should have done that academic freedom is constitutive of the freedom of the entire society. You, you simply can't have a democratic discussion unless you have somewhere a bunch of academics who have earned tenure or earned institutional security by virtue of their scholarship taking upon themselves the responsibility to try to the best of their ability, and it'll always be imperfect, to validate what is true and what isn't about a society's problems. And, um, an academic freedom's rationale is that social function, in my view. The freedom that we enjoy as academics or members of this academy is contingent on the service that we render to a society. And the service may be very critical. The service may be everything this party believes or that government believes is rubbish, everything that that church or that sect or that thing believes is rubbish. I mean. <coughs> The service can be pretty rough and ready, but it is a vital service because it makes possible a democratic discussion in which someone is asking, is this fact true, <laughs> right? Which is the thing that universities, more than any other institution, um, can and have to do. So academic freedom is not a privilege, it's a right, and because it's a right, it brings with it important responsibilities, even duties, of accountability to the society that pays our bills and serves us. And the accountability is very difficult for the society to bear because so much of what universities do is, is so damn critical. We're always, you know, we're always, every week, some 
Irish academic is releasing something about the care system in some county or um, you know, some new piece of legislation saying, you haven't got it right. Well, that's their job. And, but politicians don't like it. Um, and uh, the public can be mobilized against it because we do have middle class incomes. We do have certain kinds of securities that a garbage man might not have or a, a, a worker in a casual industry might not have. And we have to understand that resentment. We have to respect that resentment, in fact, and not <clears throat> circle the wagons and say, well, let's defend our privileges. I mean, that's a hiding to nowhere. And, uh, and so we've got a battle on our hands to get out of the monastery wall and talk to the general public and kind of help them understand why we're on their side. <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's, let's excavate those threats, because I think the, the title of the discourse, I think, is very important, because it talks about the threat from without, which we're going to talk about, but also the threat from within. Um, and let me start with the, the threat from within. Let's yeah. see if we can't pull a few moats out of our own eyes in terms, of, mm -hmm. in terms of academic freedom, its defense, and its prosecution. Now, I come from a discipline, international relations, where conceptual conversations are de rigueur. Yeah. And we have had, over the last number of decades, quite a decisive move into what you might call sort of a post-structuralist approach to some of the conversations and issues mm -hmm. we have. Now, I come from that, from that side of the house, as it were. I am, would describe myself as a social constructivist. So we, yeah. we look at concepts, how they're put together, how they're defended, how they're promoted, promulgated, and we try and deconstruct and critique and pull them apart, basically, to, to make sense of the world and understand why we have arrived yeah. to the point that we have arrived yeah. at, rather than you know, the classic, we are, we are where we are starting point. Yeah. I think that is a positive, and I see that as entirely beneficial to, to academic and public discourse. But, and here's my provocation, my thesis, which I'd love you to tear apart, by the way, there are two partial consequences of that. The first is that in tearing down established notions and foundational, what we describe as foundational truths, we have opened the path precisely to what you describe, that every argument is simply an argument. Mm -hmm. There is only discourse. There is only conversation. There is no truth. There is no foundational reality. Therefore, as you say, experts have no expertise. Scientists have no science. Truth is whatever's in the eye of the beholder. That's, that's on us, at least in part, perhaps. The second consequence, and again, this is even more, more provocative, is that in doing so, we have convinced ourselves that social reality is precisely a thing that we can build ourselves, mm -hmm. that we can create our own truths, mm -hmm. we can instantiate those truths, and we can insist upon those truths, mm -hmm. which leads us to a position in which foundational scientific and biological realities can be brought into question, mm -hmm. and more that academics then begin to police the discourse and we begin to police debate, and we begin to say, that shall not be discussed, that shall not be debated, because the truth now we have decided is thus. Do you accept any of that, or, and, and, and if not, why, and if so, what are its implications? I think that's a very penetrating critique, and also a very honest potential self-criticism of your part in the destruction of reality as we know it. <laughs> that's the, that's going to be the subtitle of my biography. You don't often hear that. You don't often hear that, folks. It's pretty pretty good stuff here. Um, I don't mean to make fun of it at all. It, it, it hmm. there's so many things to say here. Um, when I think of international relations, the area in which you work, there's not just that problem, which is the the. the the ways in which an academic discourse then becomes so self-referential, A, and B, so destructive of the possibility of construing reality as it is that we teach generations of students not to believe that anything is, unfortunately, stubbornly real. I mean, that's what you're saying. That's one problem, but the other problem is the world's going to hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other problem, which is a tremendous challenge to the academy, is that we are the creators of the narratives. We're the creators of the stories. We're the creators of the stories that allow um, folks outside to kind of make sense of the world. I mean, Fukuyama's end of history would be one example of a narrative. Whether you like it or not, it was very, very important. Um, uh, 
And that means that the university is under tremendous pressure from the society to say, what the hell is going on out there? The problem there is not, is it real or isn't it? It's crushingly real. <clears throat> People are dying <clears throat> as we speak in small towns in southeastern Ukraine, and we see it every night. And what the public is saying to international relations, and I taught it too, is what the hell's going on? Tell us a story that makes sense of this. Um, and then we're sucked into very quickly stories that support what Western governments have done sometimes in ways that are not sufficiently critical of what Western governments have done. So we're in a whipsaw of, on the one hand, an academic discipline that is deconstructing all the existing narratives we've got, a frenzied desire from the public, give us a story that we can help us understand. Western governments pouring in narratives all the time. This is an ultimate battle between democracy and authoritarianism, between good and evil, etc. <clears throat> which leads to certain inconvenient problems. I am a uncon pretty unconditional supporter of the Ukrainian side of this battle. But you're a damn fool if you think they are not committing war crimes. You're a damn fool if you don't think they are executing Russian prisoners on the battlefield. It doesn't change the ultimate rightness and wrongness of this, but let's not get our, back ourselves into a situation in which a Manichaean division between good and evil allows us to forget our duty as responsible actors to look at what the hell is happening. Um, that's an example of what I mean by <clears throat> the duty of academics is always to ask kind of difficult questions about narratives and, and, and that stuff. But I, to get back to, to your point, um, the deconstruction industry has has done some harm to the foundational claim that I was making earlier, which is universities and we're in the business of deciding what knowledge is and building granite under our feet as opposed to constantly chipping the granite away so nothing is real. I mean, that, that I, and, and so I'm hostile to, to those tendencies as I think you are in an admirably self-critical way. <clears throat> the other aspect of this which you begin to see if you if you're now spent f 50 years of your life in and out of this milieu is when I think back to being a graduate student at Harvard in 1970 I just I'm amazed at the ways in which certain discourses swept through the halls of academe and took everything over Suddenly, everybody was a Marxist. And then a couple of years later, suddenly everybody was a constructivist or a deconstructivist or a structuralist or a destructuralist or God knows what. Every time the winds blew out of Paris, we all fell over. You know? But what that tells you is, is to be very, always to be very self critical about academic fashion. There are fashions in intellectual life, just like there are fashions in shoes and clothes. And they are as coercive as the fashions in shoes and clothes. And, and, a, and a vivid intellectual life means standing up against fashion and standing up and saying, unfortunately, certain things are true, certain things aren't. This cashes out because I've done the research and this stuff is just nonsense. And we do a tremendous amount of purveying of nonsense to young people. And that's not, that's not good. And I become, frankly, more conservative as I get older. Some of the old, some of the old stuff is still the good stuff. So I was lecturing on Burke last night. I want every student who studies politics, liberal, socialist, communist, whatever your persuasions, to read Edmund Burke's Reflections on the Revolution of France. Boom. You know, I, I, so that's my response increasingly. It's a kind of, <clears throat> let's get back to the basics. Let's get back to the texts that never disappoint. Let's always give them a hard time. Shake Burke ups and upside down, turn him around until the coins fall out of his trousers. But 
we can't have an education unless we pin it on certain pillars that, that just have stood the test of time. But how do you chip and foundation at the same time? Uh, Where's your red line? Uh, uh, Where's, how, who constructs the balance? How do we construct a balance mm -hmm. between a necessary critical interrogation of so-called realities and truths, which empower the privileged, versus becoming everything becoming relative, truth not mattering a whit to anyone, and you arrive at a situation where you have a scientist who spent 30 years of her career studying climate change, faced in the studio with a know-nothing, who simply has read you know, the latest the latest something off a cigarette packet, and those two are presented as equal sides of a debate. Mm -hmm. How do we get to that pass? Blame the media. <laughs> blame three-minute culture. Blame the shrinking of our attention spans. But there's something for us to look at, I mean, oh, as yeah. academicians in oh, that. It's easier to blame the guys outside, no yeah. question about it. Um, I, I began by saying that we have an epistemological crisis in our democracy at large, and I think we're saying that we have a, an epistemological crisis inside. And your question is very challenging. <clears throat> I guess my answer, again, is a rather conservative one. When I, I've returned back to being a historian again after a sort of period of promiscuity, you know, I've come back to, into the monastery. Um, and I see how a, a good discipline, an old discipline, solves this problem. Tremendous amounts of methodological debates about how you do history. And they're tremendously interesting debates because this is such an urgent question in the, in the public. Do you tear down this statue or don't you? How do you acknowledge the imperial and colonialist and slavery legacies of institutions in this in this city, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so history is not off in the mildewing archives. It's right on the front line. But when I see a discipline doing it right, they, every day it's kind of sifting through the new books that come in, sifting through its curricula, deciding this stuff has seen the test of time. This stuff seemed a kind of fashionable instinct that hasn't really lasted, hasn't really proved out. People come back from the archives to say, well, actually, that interpretation just wasn't sustained by the archival research we did. It's boring, it's minute, it's kind of pedantic. The seminars sometimes drive you crazy because you don't know what they're talking about, but they're doing that. What they're doing is creating a kind of granite. This has proved out, this hasn't. Um, I really am a pretty, <laughs> I don't do much of it myself, but I am an empiricist. I mean, I, I think certain things turn out to be true and certain things turn out not to be true. And in history, the test is in this stuff here. You, you, you've just got to get them down off the shelves and do the hard graft. And, and that's how you get granite. The, the metaphor of granite may not be quite right. I, I, I'm looking for the, because you're constantly, maybe it's a parquet floor or something. You're, <laughs> you're constantly picking up a piece of wood that's kind of a little bit duff and tossing it outside and putting a new piece of parquet down. But it is parquet, damn it. It's not going to fall through. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's, <clears throat> and so I'm, this is about a kind of positivist answer, but, um, the reason we have academic disciplines, and the word discipline is key here, is to sort the wheat from the chaff. And academic disciplines that allow themselves to be taken over by fashions quickly discredit themselves. And academic disciplines that stubbornly sit there and try and sift the wheat from the chaff book by book, argument by argument, thesis by thesis, do give you this sense of there's flooring um, and, and if we stick to that, um, I think, uh, and sometimes that means being deliberately irrelevant to the larger conversation, not rushing into the studio, not rushing to do an op-ed, but just grinding it out. Um, 
That's the best I can do as an answer to the question. How do we avoid, I mean, I, have, I, I love the idea of the, the parquet or, or, or mosaic, you know, I, I'm, I have, in my head now I'm looking at Rome, thinking of Roman mosaics on the floor as, as right, the foundation. Right. But how do we avoid that becoming the study of dead white men? No, no. Boy. I mean, I've got a jackhammer on that, on that parquet floor because that's where I'm coming from. Yes, yes. But I know that if I, if I don't stop using the jackhammer, I'm going right through the foundation and I've got nothing under me. Yeah, well said, well said. I think the dead white male question, I feel, again, when I look back to the education I had in 1965 when I entered in the University of Toronto as an undergraduate, and I flash forward to 2022, we've really gone after the dead white problem in, in, the, in a good way. There are voices that were not heard. There were voices that were not on any curriculum in 1965, and they damn well are now. I mean, I can give you a dozen examples of that. And, my, and then the discipline, I know history, was just transformed by mostly female scholars, by scholars of color, scholars of different genders coming in there and saying, hello, <laughs> you know, wake up, you know. Um, and that's been positive. I don't, I, and that's now been incorporated in a sense into a, into a disciplinary canon in a way that I think is, is good. I don't, um, I'm an unapologetic teacher of the, the dead white males because that's what I know and that's what I know how to do. But even there, you know, you, you can't teach the history of, give you an example, <clears throat> I've taught Tocqueville all my life. You can't teach Tocqueville unless you read his writings on Algeria. Al he's a pr vigorous proponent of French imperialism in Algeria. That changes how you see his discussion of democracy. The democracy that Tocqueville believes is the European destiny is not available to North Africa. So you, you mean, that, that's a tiny example of how I'm teaching dead white males, but the dead white males are being seen in a, in a very different light. And that's how disciplines evolve and change. And, it should have happened a long time ago, but people have gone to the archive and looked at all this weird stuff Tocqueville is writing. It's fascinating, because he's a great man. But, and it's, to get a more controversial subject, I love David Hume. I'm a passionate devotee of David Hume. But it's relevant to, to recover the things he said about black people in the 18th century. It's relevant to recover the, <clears throat> associations with slavery of, of um, Bishop Barclay. It's, all of this is relevant. But the thing you want students, and this is where it gets important to me, you want students to hold two thoughts in their minds at the same time. Bishop Barclay was a great philosopher. He also had associations with slavery that we ought to know about. Hold both thoughts in your mind, but don't use one thought to cancel him at Trinity across the road where they're thinking of taking his name off the library. In Edinburgh, <clears throat> yes, understand what David Hume said about black people and Aboriginal people, but try not to forget he's the greatest philosopher produced by these islands a radical, revolutionary thinker. Hold two thoughts in your mind. But the, the instinct to erase, to cancel, is absolutely fatal to intellectual life. And, you know, it, and this, this goes through the entirety of, of our culture. Wagner, sublime artist, vicious anti-Semite, hold the two thoughts in your head. It's not hard to hold contradictory thoughts. That's what being an adult is. That's what I try and teach in my classroom. 
and defines, should define the academy, holding multiple thoughts at one head should. at the same time. It should. I hate to say this, but I'm going to put a pin in that <laughs> and invite the, yeah, the, the yeah. audience to come back to it later. But I want to, I want to pluck at another plank in the, in the academic eye in terms of the internal threats. And that is the institution of the university itself. Now, in this jurisdiction and other jurisdictions, you know, public support for universities has collapsed or has been cut. Universities now are in desperate, seat, uh, in desperate search of, of income to keep the lights on and the salaries paid. My own institution, one of the figures I saw was, you know, 70% of our income is coming from non-state sources. So really? we're, we're a business. We're out there to generate money. Yeah. A lot of that now is devoted towards inter so-called internationalization, globalization, right. the attraction of international students. Right. A lot of that is devoted to putting on campuses overseas. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is devoted to doing bespoke programs in other countries who want you know, a doctoral training program or an architectural training program or something in their jurisdiction. So we're chasing, we're chasing, we're chasing. And if I abuse Hannah Arendt's phrase, the banality of evil, mm. you know, it's not so much that academicians, academicians don't think about academic freedom. Mm. It's just that in pursuit of income, in pursuit of institutional interest, we just forget. Mm. Yeah. Is, that a, is that a fair brick to throw Ooh. with the edifice of the institution? Oh, oh. I was kind of hoping this discourse would be kind of a nice interlude before, <laughs> before an agreeable you Irish said hard. lunch. You said it's hard. It's getting harder and harder. This is really working me hard. Which is what you do when you're playing for time, frankly. I mean, look, um, I was the rector and president of a university founded 30 years ago to move Eastern Europe from democracy to freedom. And it was wisely thought that having a free university was a constituent part of a democratic transition, founded by a guy who's a, a genius at hedge fund finance. <clears throat> and so we're, I think, one of the few universities in the world that is exclusively dependent on one guy, a very, very rich, passionate, liberal progressive, who has doubled down and doubled down and doubled down and supported the university through time but never suppose that doesn't pose acute issues about academic freedom, right? The good thing about George is you can say, George, back off, you, you can push back. <clears throat> but every university is faced with this trade-off. He who pays the piper pays the tune, and you've gotta be, act the defense of institutional autonomy, if you're in a university presidency, is a daily, is, is basically your job description. You want to get resources. I think there's no shame in getting, in internationalizing, in globalizing, in seeking partnerships with private industry, for example. <clears throat> um, but you have to, the university has to set the terms of its engagement. Let me give you a spectacular example of them getting it right. Louise Richardson, a wonderful Irish woman, Vice Chancellor of Oxford University, when COVID hits, um, says we've got the labs that can generate a vaccine. Why? Because for 25 years, Oxford has been subsidizing money losing research in <clears throat> epidemiology, trying to solve problems with epidemiological disease in Africa. So these had built up extraordinary scientific expertise in this field. And it was that that created the possibility of a very fast response to the crisis. But then she did the thing that I think is, is, is crucial. She said, we need to get this thing to market quickly. And the only people who can get it to market are AstraZeneca or some farm, big pharma. And instead of listening to all the ac uh, Oxford academics saying, don't do a deal with big pharma, said, yes, yeah, we're, we're gonna do a deal with big pharma, but we're gonna set the terms of the deal. And the deal said, you've gotta sell it at cost, <laughs> and we've gotta get a revenue on the royal, we've gotta get a royalty on our intellectual property, and we're gonna use that to fund epidemiological research and biological research. Now, I don't know all the details of that deal, but that's a university not selling out to Big Pharma, but, but creating a 
a relationship of equals which understands what the university has, which is unbelievably valuable IP. And if you've got unbelievably valuable IP, you'd be a damn fool not to leverage it to get income, but you must then do so in such a way that you don't have big pharma walking all over your lab saying we're going to fund this, we'll fund that, but we won't fund that. I mean, so this is the world we're in. It's, it's, it's big time. And Louise, I think, understood what the stakes were and I think has made a transformative deal that will uh, affect how we go. Now, you look at some other issues where I'm much more troubled. Uh, you talked about internationalization and the creation of campuses overseas. I just wouldn't set up a campus in China <laughs> under any circumstances. I'd close the ones down that we've got because you can't operate in that environment freely. You just can't. I mean, the Schwarzman uh, uh, Scholarship Program, it's where Schwarzman created what was at the time a wonderful idea, which is, you know, brilliant graduates from around the world get to spend a year in China on Schwarzman's dime. Well, Schwarzman sets up a college, a linkage with Tsinghua University, and I've talked to the students who've come back from Schwarzman, and when they go to their Chinese supervisors and say, well, actually, I'm an MA student, and I, what I'd like to do is go to a Chinese provincial hospital and look at health healthcare delivery. And there's a long pause, and they say, well, not really. You're not going out of Beijing. You're not going into a hospital to do what you want to do. Well, if that's what's happening, then you can't operate in China. And you're a fool to think you can. And you can't make compromises that make this right. And some of it is grotesque. You know, in, at NYU Shanghai, what students there notice is that there's always a crowd around the entrance to NYU Shanghai. And it takes you a while to realize that what they're doing, and these are young people crowded around the entrance to NYU Shanghai, is they're holding up their cell phones to capture free Wi-Fi that you can only get at NYU Shanghai. The minute you're 150 yards away, you're into the internet controlled zone of the Chinese People's Republic. Well, if those are the terms of internationalization, I don't want to touch it. I mean, let them come here. But then, <laughs> if they come here, here's the other thing. I've had Chinese students at Harvard come to me and say, I've been a little silent in your class because the other guy in the class, I just don't know about him. I don't know whether he's reporting back to headquarters. Right? I mean, this is serious business. And the final example, and then I'll shut up, um, you know, CU has students from 120 countries. We're very proud of our internationalization. But we had an Egyptian student in Vienna post a few things on his Facebook, critical of CC, the president of Egypt. He goes back home to uh, see his mom and dad, who are devout Muslims and everything. And when he gets to the airport, the police pull him aside and say, show up at the police station tomorrow morning. He shows up at the police station and spends two years in jail. Four, get this, internet remarks posted in Vienna, right, on a, on a website. We have to understand that internationalization is now accompanied by the surveillance by certain foreign intelligence powers of the students we're so proudly teaching about academic freedom. We just have to be aware of this. I mean, I want to have Egyptian students in Europe. I want to have Chinese students in my classroom. They're always terrific. But we have to understand the pressures they're under, and we have to give them very clear guidance. At CU, we, we want to tell all of our students, watch the hell what you put on Facebook because someone else is watching you. Well, these are the dimensions of what we used to think was just unproblematic. The globalization of international education was a money spinner for European uh, institutions of prestige like your own. 
And now we're discovering that we're, we're caught in the entrails of, of, of authoritarianism. And we have this congenital inability to understand that authoritarianism is not out there in some faraway country of which we know little. In the 21st century, it's in your classroom. We brought it home. Yeah. We brought it home. I mean, you, you know, you want to get real and, and talk about examples. I mean, and, and this is within, within the Irish jurisdiction, not within any particular institution. But I'm aware of a colleague who was forced to change her textbook. I'm aware of a colleague who was required, was asked to give a public apology for a lecture in which things were said which a few students in the audience felt offended by in terms mm. of politics. We've had colleagues who have written articles and foreign companies have secured meetings with our defense uh, department to complain about what was written in the particular article. I know of a colleague who is doing a, a, a course, shall we say, on uh, anti-discrimination and was told to remove all references to gender and all reference to sexuality in terms of discrimination. Mm -hmm. We have an institution which, according to reports, detabled a nomination for an, for, for, for an honorary degree because of the sensitivities that that would raise with a major power, which shall remain nameless, mm -hmm. um, and what implications that might have for the institution. So what you're saying you know, resides here and within, mm -hmm. and is a function, as I said, not just of nasty external pressures on universities, but we're generating this ourselves. Yeah. And I'm just, again, I'm, I'm, I'm searching for, for what's the resolution, because if you look at other areas of the university, if you look at research, if you look at equality, diversity, and inclusion, if you look at uh, globalization, you know, you have an entire infrastructure within the university dedicated to that purpose. Mm -hmm. Who the hell looks out for academic freedom? Mm -hmm. And the problem I have with your example of Louise Richardson mm -hmm. is Louise Richardson. Mm -hmm. I don't know that every university has a Louise Richardson. Mm -hmm. I know, in fact, that a lot of universities don't. Mm -hmm. So who guards the guardians? Mm. You look at, the, at, at Australia now, I mean, they've, they've introduced legislation, or they felt they've had to introduce legislation to prevent Australian universities entering into international agreements that are contrary to Australian foreign policy. That is not something that I look forward to. That's not something I want to yeah. see. Yeah. But if we don't do it, who the hell will? Yeah. Yeah. And who's the we there? Because the we? final point before I, before I come back to you, you know, and I'm a conscious of the irony of, of two white middle-aged men having this conversation in front, of, in front of this audience. But academic freedom means a lot to us. But does academic freedom mean, mean a lot to an untenured junior colleague? Does academic freedom mean a lot to a woman of color? Mm -hmm. Does academic freedom mean a lot to a colleague in the global south? Mm -hmm. And my fear is that sometimes this conversation surrounding academic freedom becomes precisely, you said at the outset, a defense of existing privilege. Sure rather than something that is an enabler and a facilitator of dialogue, conversation, and truth. Hmm. Well, on that point, uh, academic freedom matters most to untenured junior colleagues. It matters most to women of color. It matters most to people of different plural forms of gender. Um, that's precisely what these institutions must must and should but they're not in a position haven't. to defend it and have them they're in the weakest position those who need it most are in the weakest position well, to defend it that's why we need to rethink this and separate it from it being the privilege of those with tenure because that immediately sets up a a fatal division uh, which is becoming worse and worse given the casualization of academic labor which you see uh, everywhere um, so we need to democratize our conception of academic freedom inside. <clears throat> and we need to make the case for it outside, and we haven't done either. And there's um, no architecture to do that. As I say, with well, equality, there, with research, we have an architecture in universities to do that. Academic freedom, it, it's, it's everything, but it's nothing. Mm. Well, we're doing a little bit right now. This is being broadcast, hello? Um, we're doing it room by room. That's all you can do. Um, having conversations as searching as this seemed to me extremely important. Um, it's not just blah, blah, blah. It's part of the process of understanding what the hell we're faced with and understanding what we do about it. So I'm not, 
um, I'm not pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic mostly because I, I think one of the ways to understand the academic freedom issue is that universities are very slow to understand the transformation of our situation in the last 70 years. We are among the most powerful and important institutions in the modern world. The attacks upon us, the pressures upon us in a democratic society and from authoritarian society is a testimony to the realization that everybody has that we are the our knowledge is the key source of the economic creativity and productivity of the entire society. We train the entire um, future of our societies, for better or worse. Our, our, our education function is critical. Our knowledge production function is critical. These societies depend much more than ever before on this kind of knowledge. And it's therefore little surprise that everybody's coming at us. And there's little surprise that when we do these complicated partnerships with private industry, with whatever, and it is little surprise that governments are saying, because we're extremely expensive, are we getting value for money? It's absolutely appropriate for governments in Ireland to say, what have you done for us lately, frankly? And we have to have a very good story. And it's a story that has to be, <laughs> it's a tough story because it, it has to say on the one hand, listen government, we're gonna do a lot of useless, we're gonna do a lot of useless things first of all that have no conceivable benefit to you whatever, things like pure science. We have some nut bar doing, you know, investigating photons and neutrons and protons. The, some of the science is impossible to sell to, to, to government because it's so abstract, so impossible to understand. And then the other thing we're going to do is we're going to give you a very hard time. We're going to have you know, people like you criticizing us all the time. And you're not going to like that. Okay, that's the second thing you're not going to like. And thank you, we'll, we'll, we'll have the money. Right? I mean, it's a very... It's, it's a tough it's, sell. It's a tough, it's, it's a tough sell. But we have to do it because we have to say, let's get up above this and understand what Ireland, Britain, any country actually wants. You really want to have world-class universities. You really want to have it. It is crucial to Ireland's future. And then you lay out why that's the case. And so you're not gonna like a lot of what we do, but if you want world-class universities, you have to do two things. You have to give us sufficient intellectual, uh, institutional autonomy over our curriculum, what we teach, how we teach, when we teach, who we teach, the institutional autonomy piece. And you have to allow us the academic freedom to set and define our curriculums, to set and define what we teach, and to set and define what we say in the public prints. That's the deal. If you want world-class institutions in this Ireland, this is what you have to have, okay? Right? And it's gonna be rough and it's gonna be bumpy, but that's the ticket. And every international study of this confirms that that's what you have to do. Institutions that are enslaved to government are inevitably mediocre. Institutions where ministers tell you what to think and what to do and what to fund are mediocre, right? So, you know, wakey, wakey, that's the conversation you have to have. And the, and the other thing, and this is a very elitist play and not bound to be popular, but I believe it all the way down, we are among the oldest self-governing institutions in the world. I was in Padua, for a little holiday with my beloved about three weeks ago. Padua is just celebrating the 800th anniversary of the university. Trinity was, is 1592, right? These are old corporate institutions that have ruled themselves for a very long time. And the reason that they are good is that they are self-governing. There have been tremendous problems with self-governance, they become corporate, enclosed, corrupt, 
church dominated, whatever you want, but that kernel of the history, which is that they were self-governing free institutions, is central to the history of European liberty itself. And so you, 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 know, you, you really want to defend that. This place has a royal charter, right? It's a partic Trinity has a particular history. You've got you to put the history on your shoulders here and make the case. We're not just some other productive unit in a you know, 21st century economy. We've been here before you, we'll be here after you, frankly. Now, nobody wants to hear that, but that really is the guts of it. When I stand up as a university president, I feel that I am representing not the tradition of my 30-year-old university, but a much wider and deeper tradition that's basically a tradition of freedom. And, and that's what we want to say. Now, it's a, it's a persuasive case to me, obviously. <laughs> but let me, let me, let me. But make... I think if you let me loose on an Irish minister of education, <laughs> I'd, I'd have a hard time. I, I, yeah. I'd take it. I'm... But let me, let me, as, as a close before we open it up to the to, to conversation, you know, institutional autonomy and academic freedom. But do you trust the academy to deliver if given those two things? Mm. And if so, why? I don't always trust the academy to deliver. Sometimes it, the academy will use institutional autonomy to close itself off, become a kind of corporatist old boys club. I don't trust the disciplines not to become enclosed in a kind of self-referential downward spiral. I mean, there are enormous difference, difficulties. I don't excuse the possibility that universities get completely captured by um, you know, woke progressives, you know, canceling lectures that they don't want to hear. There are all kinds of internal dangers. And we have to, we really have to fight this stuff because this provides the enemies of free universities the pretext they need to hit us hard. And you see this very strongly in the United States. It is extraordinary to me, in fact, and a sign of the university's centrality to the cultural and social and political debates of our time, that the, the question of woke culture on an American campus is the bell to ring if you're a right-wing populist in the United States. You'd think, who cares what the hell they're doing at Princeton or Harvard? And yet this is the, the issue to plug away at if you want to win votes in Ohio, for God's sake. What does that tell you? It tells you how central the university has become to a society's self-definition. But if that's the case, then we have to clean up our act. I mean, it's just unacceptable to have um, places devoted to freedom shouting down or suppressing uh, speech, um, becoming little tyrannous covens of political correctness. I mean, it's, it's mortal. So in terms and of I, you know, I, I, I still, you know, I, I had a, the worst day I had as rector of Central European University was not my battle with Viktor Orban. It was the day 60 students walked out of a lecture of, by Roger Scruton because they didn't like a conservative homophobe lecturing them. I despise his homophobia, by the way. I mean, I think any reasonable person does who's looked at what Roger Scruton has said about gay people. But he's conservative. He was invited to give a lecture on conservatism, and he was deliberately invited to take apart all the liberal platitudes that we hold so dear. And he did his job extremely well. But 50 students got up before he even spoke and walked out. Well, this stuff is poison, absolute poison. And Victor Orban sat there to the degree that he cares about us at all, thinking, yeah, exactly, that's what's wrong with Central European University. So we've got, we've got stuff to do here. Okay. I promise I'd give plenty of time and space for, for conversation and discussion, and I do get a sense that there are a lot of questions, a lot of comments in the audience. Um, so why don't we open it up and, and take some questions, and I think we have some microphones um, that people can use to, to pose their question or, or make their comment. So if anyone would just like to indicate in the traditional way, please, here to my right. And if everybody would just, as I say, wait till you get the microphone, if you just briefly introduce yourself too, please. Um, 
good, good uh, afternoon. Uh, and my name is Dr. Nalo Gofinila. Thank you both very, very much. It's such an important topic. And um, I have a couple of remarks to make, and then I have a question that I'm hoping you can help with. F first of all is that um, you, we spoke a little bit about um, the past and the achievements of the past, and sometimes when we look at, for example, Marxism and Christianity, these are disciplines that are fully constituted. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they have a knowledge that we have benefited from, even if we're not practicing Marxists or practicing Christians. The mm -hmm. knowledge absorbs. Mm -hmm. And um, we study and we have our sources, and this is very, very important. And so we also then have the advantages of our foundational research, you know, building up the structures of our buildings, of our mind. Mm -hmm. But the positive research has brought about great achievements, and so we have this outwarding effect that is, you know, knowledge transfer and mainstreaming and so forth. But one of the challenges always is that um, tenure is one thing. But when you don't seek tenure and you seek really good positions, you have a remarkable CV, and mm. I'm quite sure you do. Mm. So it's um, sometimes tenure allows you great security and stability in your life, but when you actually, you know, as you say, take that journey into public life and into what mm. is the university life, it gives you a profound knowledge of mm. how knowledge works. Mm. And so those are my remarks that brought me mm. then to a study which is looking very, very much at, at uh, core research when I had spent so much of my life in practice and, and research mm. practice and performative practice and so forth. Mm. But, and I spoke to the director of CERN about this as well and it's a most important challenge for the university to really dig their heels in. Mm. And that is the rationalization is not financial for core research but it is of the very, very foundational principles that are easily described. Because you cannot have profound changes in society unless you have a, a structural shift that's paradigmatic. Mm -hmm. And this we already know. So when you're in the media and the person who is beside you is versed in maybe the issue of the day, you, they're looking to you for that foundation. They're alongside you in the chair beside you. It doesn't mean they have your knowledge. So you don't have to feel that fear. You can be quite, I'm quite sure, arrogant and strong about it, you know, and you must be, mm. because people take these things for granted. Mm. And the other thing is that the financial structures, the rationalization of our research, you know, how, what do we count as value? It, it's not so much about, um, you know, being able to itemize everything, but it's been making sure that the person who is carrying out the research can go that journey. Mm. And this is something that's very, very difficult. So time and freedom. Time and freedom is about reality, is establishing new realities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, there isn't a percentage between core research and applied research. Mm -hmm. But how do we dedicate that kind of devotion? It's not necessarily tenure either, but mm -hmm. it's investment in big questions. How do you do this? In, mm -hmm. You're president of a Central European University. You have omnistasis. Mm -hmm. You also have an a, a mind that's able to leap in and out of the public domains. Mm. You have a respect for them. What is the kind of argument you can use for this? Can Thank I you. let you cogitate that for a minute? Because I'd like to get as many colleagues in as I possibly can. I've got two colleagues here, here on, on this side of the aisle, and then on that side of the aisle, if we could get the microphones. Here. And then just two rows back. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is Alex Tukolsky. I'm in the School of Politics and International Relations at University College Dublin. Uh, and I'm also the uh, Academic Freedom Officer, which is a newly created post in the Political Studies Association of Ireland. Uh, you talked a little bit about your um, experiences with academic freedom leading CEU, kind of from the Soros side, and you briefly alluded to it there from, from the government side. I'm just wondering if you can reflect more on your the strategies that you took and basically what it was like to come under that kind of uh, assault uh, from an authoritarian government. Thanks. And then finally, the gentleman here. Don Lebron Lacan. Uh, I'm not attached to any academic institution. You've talked about academic freedom and uh, university autonomy uh, completely in a self-referential -ref way. There are other groups in society that claim equal autonomy and equal freedom to exercise uh, their skills based on a body of knowledge which most people would assume that they will 
uh, contribute that uh, on some form of altruism. Mm -hmm. I mean, the classic professions of medicine, law, engineering, if you like, and more recently, journalists who will say they're asking questions uh, that the ordinary man wants to know, and they claim that autonomy. Both groups are like you. They are also subject to uh, financial pressures, and more importantly, they're subject to what I call the increasing uh, exercise of their professional skills and knowledge, including the acquisition, in bureaucratic type institutions. Mm -hmm. And you get controls coming in that limit this uh, by, say, man manpower control frameworks. So mm -hmm. do you ever compare yourselves to these other, I'll use the word, professions uh, that are based, uh, and, and if so, uh, mm. what, do you, what mm. might you, how would you line up right. with them? Right. Easy questions, Michael, easy Boy. questions. Boy. <laughs> I'd like to start with the last question because I think it, um, um, it points out, you, you said that our discussion was self-referential, and I think that's a good criticism. Um, and I think the way to think about academic freedom in a sort of historical, sociological way is to remember that one of the, the glories of a free society is that the medical profession regulates the medical profession. The lawyers are supposed to regulate the lawyers. Um, journalists have some, some degree of internal self-regulation. And in a free society, you absolutely do not want the government telling you what a what a doctor should be. I mean, the doctors have to decide what medical qualification looks like, and they should discipline doctors who fail. Ditto with the lawyers, um, the law societies around the world. Um, and in a free society, you have this distribution of credentialing, disciplining, uh, entitling various professions. And you ought to see academic, the academic, academic freedom within that sociological context. And then if you step back, you know, and you start thinking about Montesquieu, just if you'll allow me to be, you know, it's a professional deformation. I can't stop referring to these dead white European males, but they have guided me all my life and I'm, I'm stuck with them. But Montesquieu, you know, when, when Montesquieu defined what a free society was, he kept talking about the, les corps intermédiaires. You know, a free society is not simply majority rule, parliament. It is also um, self-regulating professions that are proud of what they do, have an obligation to fulfill to a society, <clears throat> but have the right to determine um, uh, the terms and condition of entry into those professions. They often misuse that. I mean, to give you a little example, one of the scandals in my country, Canada, we're a multicultural society and we're constantly bringing in a million people a year, but the doctors are very, very careful to keep foreign credential doctors off the medical list. So that's an example of abuse, in my view, of that credentialing function. But you, in a free society, you absolutely want to have um, independent institutions that credential and authorize certain kinds of knowledge. Doctors, lawyers, university professors. So I, I think you're absolutely right. That's a, and it's one way in which I think we can make some friends by making the other professions realize that we're all in the same business of defending a certain vision of a free society. That, I think, what I would say. As for the second question about um, uh, what it was like uh, to deal with academic freedom, um, I, I think I, I've said something about my relationships with George Soros. I, I, I count myself lucky that he's the kind of guy who you can say, no, wait a minute, this far, George, and no further. Um, and that's enormously to his credit. And, but it's very uncertain. 
I mean, he's enormously wealthy and therefore enormously powerful, and it's difficult to say no, but you have to sometimes. Um, and I think every university president who deals with a big donor is in that situation. And instead of saying, yes, sir, thank you so much, what can we do for you? You have to say, here are the conditions under which we can accept your gift, and if they, you can't meet those conditions, we can't take the gift. Um, think about Johns Hopkins. Bloomberg, who graduated from Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg has given them, you know, two, three, four billion dollars. Well, Ron Daniels, the president of Johns Hopkins, his duty is to tell Bloomberg this far and no further. We're going to use the money for this, but not for that. And that's, that's what the defense of institutional autonomy comes down to in relation to rich donors. As for Orban, that part of my life, um, I, I think the thing that would be relevant to an Irish audience is that to a degree that I think European audiences do not appreciate, there is no legal language in the European legal legislation that explicitly protects and defends academic freedom. So the European Commission and the European Parliament have no levers, no institutional levers, to um, force a member state to um, stop infringements of academic freedom. To a degree, again, that Europeans don't appreciate the values that Europe are supposed to instantiate in terms of democracy and freedom are not in treaty law. What's in treaty law is commercial law. The EU is a commercial operation. And so when we went to, when our case about violations of academic freedom went to the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice had a real problem. They, there was no law that they could turn to to deal with a situation in which a member state expelled a academic institution which meant which met every criteria of academic performance, but was being expelled for transparently political reasons. And what they did was they used commercial law. They said that Orban had infringed our right to set up a business. The university is a business. We're a corporate entity. We were thrown out of a, of a member state and deprived of our right to exercise freedom of trade. But everybody in this room needs to understand, in other words, that you, if, if some abomination happened to academic freedom in Ireland, God forbid, you look around European treaty law, you're, you're going to have to use commercial law to defend yourself. So that would be one hopefully relevant comment to me. As for this very searching set of thoughts about co-research and European uh, sponsorship of research, and you referred to CERN and stuff, that's tremendously above my um, pay grade. All, all I would say there, watching European, but watching European research decisions at the kind of, you know, at the platoon level as opposed to the general level, is that, yes, European member states and the Commission and the European institutions are creating very large envelopes for research funding, and that's, and it's a constant struggle to ensure that all the useless things, like the humanities and other things, receive adequate funding because big science is pulling huge amounts of research resources. But the thing that has impressed me, just judging with ERC, European Research Council adjudication, is that it really is down to the professors. It really is decided, the allocation of grants is decided. Now there's a certain amount of countrywide horse trading, I mean, to 
to give you the flavor of this, one of the reasons, frankly, that Central European University did so spectacularly well in ERC funding applications is that there weren't too many country, uh, applicants from Hungary who made the grade. So I won't deny that your position in Europe sometimes can play to your advantage, and I'm sure the canny Irish will play that to the max, for example. But that apart, and apart from the enormous pressure that the big government funders have in structuring these envelopes, the actual allocation seems to me to meet the criteria of academic freedom. That is, that it's done on, on academic merit, and that's an enormously good thing and must be protected and defended at all costs. Another round? Other questions, comments from the floor? Please, first one here. And, and, and also in the front, so yeah, please start with yourself, yeah. Son. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Adam Coleman. At the moment, I'm hoping to start a PhD on Edmund Burke's Irish afterlife in, in, in 19th and 20th centuries at Oxford uh, next autumn. I just have two questions, if you don't mind. Could you pull the mic away from your face a little because you're popping? Just okay. keep going. But Is I that just, it? That's better. Is that yeah. okay? Sorry. Uh, did you hear the first part? Did, yeah. you hear, did you hear the first part of my introduction? Uh, sort of. Okay, so I'll just start again. My name's Adam Coleman. I'm, I'm a, at the moment, I hope to start a PhD on Edmund, Edmund Burke's um, Irish um, afterlife in, yeah. at Oxford next year. Just two questions. Uh, as, a, as a public intellectual, how would you describe or define the role of, of public intellectuals today in the age of Twitter yeah. and the three minute mind as you described it yeah. earlier? And secondly, uh, what advice would you give to a, um, an aspiring academic PhD student in an age, based on your own experience, in an age where the yeah, academia itself seems to be, seems like a, like a sinking ship, like, uh, you know, yeah. like not a very inspiring yeah. model and yeah. just that uh, thoughts would be appreciated. Thank you. Gosh, I hope, we, I hope we haven't put you off, but we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, Michael will be inspiring in just one moment. There's another question or comment here, please. Yeah. Oh, yes. I just wanted to ask you. How soon do you think the students who are currently in the university, for example, who are the woke students, who can't hold two thoughts in their head, so that they, that will become the professors within the university? I mean, heretofore you've always been criticized by, I'm sure, when someone employs, applies for a job, that you would appoint somebody who reflects in many ways, your own standards and your own thoughts, and they get the job yep. because you feel that they will carry on the tradition that you have. Mm -hmm. and, but there are students, obviously, the 60 or 40, 50 who walked out, who don't feel the same way and don't reflect what you think. So what happens then? No. And then just finally this round, Here at the back. Hi, my name is Nino. Uh, I'm from the Georgian Embassy. Well, thank you for this very interesting conversation. As the academic freedom is very crucial in every learning in school and university and around the world, my question is how can we all protect that academic freedom from the propaganda and from the disinformation? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Again, easy questions, Michael. Oh, boy. Um, Public intellectual in the age of Twitter, um, <laughs> I, I've always, I have been called a public intellectual all my life simply because I have I've had a promiscuous life and, and I, I've often felt public intellectual was the kind of kiss of death, you know, the, the last thing I wanted to be called was a public intellectual. Because um, it, it also relates to a a history, you know, that goes back to Sartre and Camus and all that stuff that I, in which intellectuals had an authority, a cultural authority, which has vanished. <clears throat> but even at the time, I think, i.e. in the Paris of the 1940s and 50s, was a big mistake anyway. So I'm, I'm critical and dubious about the whole definition of a public intellectual. Um, 
What I'm not dubious about is, is um, people who know something, really know something, that is people who've mastered a discipline, getting into the public debates and courageously defending what they actually know. I think the temptation for public intellectuals and the temptation for academics in public platforms is relatively easy to define. It is, you must avoid the temptation to talk about stuff you don't know anything about. I mean, the really fatal thing is to think you're kind of omnicompetent. And, you know, I feel the, such authority as I ever had as a so-called public intellectual had to do with the fact that I knew, knew something about something. I really knew it. I did a lot of talking about the Balkans in the 90s. I felt I was entitled to do that because I'd stalked and traveled and walked and traversed every step of the ground. I felt I had the authority to talk about the Balkans because I knew something about it. Not more than anybody else, but I knew what I knew. <clears throat> um, the fatal temptation is when you go from that to start talking about stuff that you, you know, well, I'm glad you asked me that question, and then you, you, can, you just go over the cliff. So it's understanding where your intellectual authority lies and not, you know. But that helps me to answer the second question, which is, you know, why do academic life at all? Because it's a sinking ship. When I did my PhD in 1969 at Harvard, I thought I was joining a sinking ship. So don't be too discouraged, you know. <laughs> It's always sinking is the point, but somehow the, the damn ship never quite goes down. You know, um, it's, what am I telling you? I'm telling you it's lonely and discouraging to do academic work. Uh, I deeply remember how lonely and discouraging it was when I was in my 20s. And I nearly went under, frankly, but I got through it and got a PhD, and I now know what I know. My academic training was crucial to giving me a sense that I had a certain limited authority on a few subjects. And that sustained me ever since. And so I just hope you don't get discouraged and you come out of it knowing what you know and then using it to speak, to argue, to write, to change people's minds. Um, and, I, and I think it's the most wonderful profession in the world. I really do. And uh, don't want you to drop out and slip away and think the ship is sinking, because the ship is always sinking. That's, the, that's what I would have to say. The, this, the, the next question, um, I may have forgotten some of the flavor of it, but I heard you say in the, in the, in the course of it that there's always a danger in recruitment that you begin to choose your own. And, and so academic hiring, like all professions, begins what you, what you end up doing, although you won't admit it to yourself, is re reproducing yourself and reproducing your own, essentially your own biases. And this is what it means to work in an academic discipline. The word discipline seems to me crucial here. To understand that your responsibilities are not to reproduce yourself, but to make your discipline stronger, make your department stronger, for example, by hiring somebody who precisely doesn't agree with you. It's extremely difficult to do that because they're often very disagreeable. They come in and they start challenging your your, the, your monumental scholarly achievements and your sublime wisdom. But that's what you have to do. You're not here to reproduce yourself. You're here to strengthen your discipline in your department and, and it's very easy to forget that. And, uh, but great departments and great disciplines um, do not allow themselves to be captured by fashions do not allow themselves to be captured by cliques and are constantly seeking to reproduce a genuine pluralism in their disciplines. 
And if there's one thing that, you know, dead white males like me, and I'm nearly dead, have learned about a multicultural and pluralist society that's come into being since I was a young man, is that pluralism, social, racial, sexual, gender, political, everything, is good for thought. It is, in fact, the condition of modern intellectual creativity. And if you don't understand that, you don't understand anything about why modernity, living right here and now, is the only time I would want to be alive. Because I do remember what my classroom was like in 1965, and I don't want to go back to it. Because they all look like me. And that's not, that is not a ticket to intellectual growth and development. So, now there was another question. Final question about disinformation Oh yeah, about, propaganda. oh, about, well, you got to do a thousand of these. You got to get out all the time and talk about this. The, the, the initial question made the very good point is we do too much talking to ourselves. We're all convinced that academic freedom is a terrific idea, the universities are wonderful, and that we're much misunderstood. And we keep saying that to ourselves over and over again to make ourselves feel better. That is not a strategy of communication. That's a strategy of comfort. And instead of a strategy of comfort, we need a strategy of engagement and go out to, yes, political parties, yes, to people who've criticized us, and say, okay, let's, let's have this out. You have a problem with universities? Let's do some business together, let's talk. It's the only way to go. And then constantly, when you see fake news, when you see propaganda, when you see disinformation, use the social media to, 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 to call it out. But we've got to stop comforting ourselves and consoling ourselves and also thinking we're weak, defenseless, embattled. Remember what I said, we're the most powerful institutions in this society and we don't realize it. And the issue is how to use our power well and responsibly in service of these societies because they would go down without us, believe me. Just think about COVID. I mean, that's why I use the Louise Richardson, where did, where did the vaccines come from, for God's sake? They came from our labs. And, and there's no more dramatic demonstration of why we matter. And um, so we have to say this over and over, and not to ourselves anymore, but out to the world. Thanks, Michael. Before I hand over to the President for, for closing remarks, just my own personal thanks to you for, for coming today, for having this conversation, and, and thanking you particularly for, for your engagement. Um, and I know it's a bit of a cliche, but this is not just a conversation that needs to be continued, but there needs to be a plan of action. And I think scholars and the Academy need to think about what we actually do about this, rather than talk amongst ourselves about this. But yeah. may we'll have that for another day. Please, President. I think everybody here is going to agree that the Academy fulfills its responsibility to have <clears throat> important conversations within these walls. And this was a very important conversation, an important conversation for Ireland and an important conversation in internationally. And we have probably tired you out hugely, Michael. I heard all the questions you took last night and again now and and i feel that probably you're going to get on the plane leaving ireland and say Whew, gosh that was tough but but we're very grateful for that i'd like to also before i close this uh, make a few personal comments this is a very important time for us and i think i mentioned this to you last night because there is a bill going through our um, parliament at the moment, uh, which uh, in the view of many academics, severely limits further uh, the autonomy of our higher education institutions. And we have fought, and no matter how much we've, we've uh, tried, we have not convinced our politicians. So that's a bit of a failure here, but um, I, I, I think we'll, 
we'll still, we'll still keep going. I'm sorry you didn't meet the minister. That would have been a very, very good uh, discussion, I think. Um, on a personal note, I would also like to say that I truly enjoyed your wonderful book on consolation, which I read three or four months ago. And at a time that is so troubling for us all and has posed so many questions and problems for all of us um, out there, there are so many challenges and you've mentioned some of them. I do recommend others to read this book. On Consolation is a series of, I think, quite brilliant essays. Um, you said last night that you didn't have enough literature in there. I thought you had plenty in Anna Akhmatova and Albert Camus, to name but two. But wonderful essays on how philosophy and the thoughts of um, writers from the Bible onwards have given us some um, some thoughts to get us through these dark times. So thank you very much. Um, so it just falls to me to close this meeting formally. I would like to thank our secretary, uh, Mary O'Dowd, for organizing this program and for uh, inveigling you to come here. I would like to thank Ben for uh, really penetrating and indeed very wide ranging questions, which um, I think has given us all further cause for thinking what we might do here inside these walls, Ben, so thank you very much. The next Academy Discourse will be on Tuesday the 29th of November at 6 p.m. We will have the Nobel Laureate Sir Peter Ratcliffe who will speak about understanding human oxygen sensing, adventures of a physician in science. Uh, Professor Ratcliffe is Director of the Clinical Research at the Francis Crick Institute in London and Director of the Target Discovery Institute in the University of Oxford, relating back perhaps already to some of the, some of the, uh, the points you made. Details of these events are all on the Academy website, www.ria.ie. I hope you'll be able to join us then. Thank you for attending today's discourse. And for those of you who are online, um, well, I'm sorry you were online, but I'm glad also that you, were, you will be able to, uh, to realize that there was a very stimulating and wonderful atmosphere in our meeting room today. I'd like to, in the uh, traditional uh, method, to thank uh, Michael and Ben for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you.